Hello everyone, this is uh, Sam Changshi from the School of Intellectual Property in the East China University of Political Science and Law. This is a lecture on trademarks. Today, trademarks are one of the most important business assets owned by companies and even individuals. In this lecture, as what we have done in the previous lectures on patents, we will explore the legal system for the protection of trademarks in China from a comparative perspective. This lecture comprises four sessions. Session one is about the concept of a trademark. What is a trademark? Put simply, trademarks are distinguishable signs. From the perspective of uh, historical developments, trademarks existed before the birth of a modern trademark law, even in China. Session 2 is about uh, registrable marks and statutory requirements for registration with the trademark office. Trademarks are distinctive signs capable of indicating the source of goods or services. It must be distinctive and many other requirements. Section 3. Trademark Registration Proceedings Our trademark law follows so-called the force to fire principle, similar to the principle in Patent law is composed of both pre-granting proceedings and post-granting proceedings. This is a system trying to keep balance between the efficiency of trademark examination and accuracy of examination. And it's also a legal system trying to strike a balance between the protection of competing interests of different players on the market and mostly the interests of individual consumers. Section 4 Trademark Rights, Infringements, Defenses and Remedies How to establish a legal rights for the use of a mark what are the exclusive rights conferred by a registered trademark? What are the liabilities arising from trademark infringements? Any potential defenses available to the defendants against the claims of trademark infringements? And what are the uh, remedies available to a trademark owner whose rights being infringed? Session 1. What is a trademark? Our story with the trademark law may start from the Great War of China. The Great War of China is well known as uh, military defense, which started being built in the 5th century. It's about uh, 5,500 miles long, the longest man-made structure in the world. The ancient bricks, bricks in the world were about uh, four times the size of a modern house brick and were produced by thousands of people from numerous uh, kings, some of uh, which still exist. It was reported that 48 kings from Ming Dynasty built for this purpose were found in Hubei province. If you ever took a closer look at each piece of uh, the bricks in the wall, you will see many of the bricks are stapled with the hieroglyphics, Chinese characters. These Chinese characters are, are the names of the makers of the bricks. Why would uh, the names of the makers of these bricks were stapled on the bricks? you may find the names of uh, the makers on each piece of the bricks in Nanjing city wall and the city wall of many other ancient Chinese cities. 
The construction of the 19th ancient city wall was a legacy of the Ming Dynasty, begun in 1366. When the job was completed, over 3 million bricks had been used. Today, around 2 million bricks used in about 20 kilometers of the wall still exist. Others were destroyed or lost in wars. Why the names of the makers were stapled on the bricks produced by him or her? Was it to make him or her famous? Of course not. The names on the bricks were just the symbols to the emperors of each empire, telling him who should be responsible for, if not liable for, the quality of the bricks. But later on, the makers of many other ordinary commodities not under the order were very happy to have their names stapled on the products produced by them. Why? Because it can make them famous. Today, trademark is uh, known as a symbol that indicates who is responsible for the goods placed on the market. So those trademarks are distinguishable signs known as a sign or signs used for or intended to be used to distinguish goods or services dealt with or provided in the course of trade by a person from goods or services so dealt with or provided by another person. Now let's uh, watch the following piece of uh, video, which is about uh, 10 minutes of uh, brief introduction to trademark basics in the US. And uh, it will give you the entire picture of uh, the legal system for the protection of trademarks in the United States. And then we will have around two hours for the details of this legal system in China. Keep in mind what the differences and similarities between the two legal systems in the two countries. Hi, I'm Stan Muller. This is Crash Course Intellectual Property, and today we're talking about trademarks. Trademarks are everywhere, and they can often be confusing, so today we're going to talk about why just about everything seems to be trademarked, and why trademarks are good for business. Mr. Mueller, trademarks don't intersect with my life, so I really don't see why we need to cover this. One, it's Mueller, and two, just watch the video. <laughs> A trademark is any word, name, symbol, or device used to identify and distinguish goods from those manufactured or sold by others, and to indicate the source of the goods, even if that source is unknown. This bit about unknown sources means that you, as a consumer, don't usually know the person or factory that actually made the goods you buy. Before the Industrial Revolution, you often knew exactly who was making your stuff and how it was made. If you wanted a hammer, you went to the blacksmith, and you knew his name. It was probably Smith. These days, brand names assure you that you're buying the same product, say, toilet paper that you bought last time you went shopping, you know, like the stuff with the ripples. Seriously though, getting the wrong medication because of brand name confusion or counterfeiting could be disastrous. The rationale for granting legal protection for trademarks is that they're a type of property. It demonstrates to the purchasing public a standard of quality and embodies the goodwill and advertising investment of its owner. In other words, companies expend a tremendous amount of resources to develop the product, market it to customers, and provide customer support and back up their product with warranties. At its core, trademark law functions as a consumer protection measure. It prevents consumer confusion and makes it easier for consumers to select and purchase the goods and services they want. For example, if you go shopping for a new television, you don't have to sift through dozens of products that are confusingly similar to Samsung. Knockoffs like Samsung or Whamsung or Sony. You want the Samsung, maybe based on past experience or the company's reputation or even a funny ad. Because the law protects the manufacturer's use of the trademark, you can be reasonably sure that the TV you're picking up at Best Buy is the TV you saw The Verge reporters freaking out about at CES. Though trademarks are often classified as intellectual property, the Supreme Court held in the 1879 trademark cases that Congress has no power to protect or regulate trademarks under the Intellectual Property Clause of the Constitution, which, as you'll recall, provides Congress with the authority to regulate and protect copyright 
rights and patents. But this didn't stop Congress from regulating trademarks. They used the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which gives them the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Beyond trademarks, there are also service marks, which are very similar in that they distinguish one particular service. An example of a service mark is that roaring lion at the beginning of MGM movies. It's registered for motion picture production or something. Trade dress or product packaging is protected if it's distinctive and non-functional. Like the shape of a Nutter Butter cookie is protected trade dress. What they ought to trademark is the smell. Some people have registered smells. And we'll get to that in a minute. Trademarks are symbols, and since human beings might use as a symbol or device almost anything that is capable of carrying meaning, just about any conceivable thing can function as a trademark. Trademarks can be words like craft or Lego, logos, designs like the Nike swoosh, aromas like there's a brand of oil for race cars that smells like cherries, sounds like bong 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 or ba da 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 dong or dong 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 or ba da ba ba ba. Even do is a registered trademark. You can register colors like UPS Brown or Home Depot Orange or Tiffany Blue or John Deere Green. Personal names like Taylor Swift. T. Swizzy's name is registered for 61 different goods and services, from shoes to Christmas tree ornaments. Even containers like the Coca-Cola bottle or this perfume bottle shaped like a human skull can be registered. In short, they can be almost anything that distinguishes the product from others and which signifies the source of the goods. Despite the breadth of potential trademark subject matter, there are some limits on what can be a valid trademark. Recently, a restaurant in Texas asserted trademark rights in the flavor of its pizza. One of the restaurant's former employees allegedly stole the recipe and opened up a competing pizza joint, selling pizzas that tasted a lot like those made by his former employer. The judge rejected the claim and dismissed the case, finding that it is unlikely that flavors can ever be inherently distinctive because they do not automatically suggest a product's source. Also, functional product features are not protectable under trademark law. Pizza has only one function, that's to taste delicious. So there are three requirements for trademarks. We just discussed the first one, that a trademark has to be a symbol or device that a court or the Patent and Trademark Office deems to qualify. The second requirement is that the mark has to be used in interstate commerce. And the third is that it has to identify the mark owner's goods and distinguish them from those manufactured or sold by others. It has to be distinctive. Let's talk about trademarks and what makes them distinctive in the thought window. Courts rank trademark distinctiveness along a spectrum, ranging from unprotectable to highly protectable. At the bottom end of the spectrum is generic. Generic names refer to stuff like using the word orange for the fruit, or dog for the canine, or cheese for cheese. Descriptive terms simply describe the goods and convey an immediate idea of what the product is, such as break and bake for scored cookie dough. Suggestive marks require some imagination or perception to link them to the goods, like chic for Middle Eastern food, or Fruit Loops for a circular fruit-flavored breakfast cereal. Arbitrary marks are common words used in unexpected ways. Apple for computers, or Amazon for book sales, or Shell for gasoline. The most distinctive marks are usually made-up words. Fanciful marks are non-dictionary words such as Google for an internet search engine, or Clorox for bleach, or Kodak for film. Fanciful, arbitrary, and suggestive marks receive automatic protection upon use because they're considered to be inherently distinctive. So the owner of the break and bake mark has to show that consumers identify the product with Nabisco or Pillsbury or whoever makes the product. I honestly don't know who makes it, which isn't a good sign as to whether it's acquired secondary meaning. Generic terms are never entitled to protection. This becomes important when trademarks are gradually assimilated into the language as common names. Through a process sometimes called genericide, the public comes to view such names as referring to the products themselves rather than as distinguishing the source of the products. As a result, the name loses its protection. Words like escalator, cellophane, and aspirin were all once protected by trademark. This process is ongoing today, and there are a lot of modern marks that are threatened by genericide, like Google or Kleenex or Photoshop or Xerox. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So once an owner meets the requirements for trademark and has a protected product, they'll often put a TM or a little R in a circle next to a product name or brand. The TM shows that the owner is asserting trademark in the product. When you see the little circle R, that means the trademark has been registered with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Like in copyright law, once you're registered with the feds, you have standing to take your case to federal court and maybe be awarded damages. Once the PTO is satisfied that the mark meets all the requirements, the application is published for opposition. Anyone who might be affected by the registration has 30 days to oppose it. If no one opposes, the mark is registered. The owner is then required to file affidavits of continuous use. Basically, you have to submit proof that you're still selling the product associated with the trademark. You have to do this every five years to maintain the registration. Trademark owners can do this forever.
This is different than patents and copyrights whose trademarks are doomed by the limited times language in the intellectual property clause. So when it comes to trademarks, you have to use it or lose it. Trademarks are often disputed, and in pretty much every case, likelihood of confusion is the central issue. The principle set forth in an 1877 Supreme Court opinion in an unfair competition case. What degree of resemblance is necessary to constitute an infringement is incapable of exact definition as applicable to all cases. All that courts of justice can do in that regard is to say that no trader can adopt a trademark so resembling that of another trader as that ordinary purchasers buying with ordinary caution are likely to be misled. Every court uses a slightly different set of criteria for deciding trademark cases. We're gonna talk about the Seventh Circuit Court of the United States definition, which has seven parts. Those criteria are one, similarity between the marks in appearance and suggestion, two, similarity of the products, three, the area and manner of concurrent use, which means where in the United States the product is for sale, four, the degree of care likely to be exercised by consumers, five, the strength of the plaintiff's mark or how distinctive it is, Six, whether there's evidence that people were actually confused, which is a pretty strong sign that there's a likelihood of confusion. And seven, whether the defendant intended to palm off his product as that of the plaintiff. These factors are gonna be weighed differently in individual cases, but the court has often noted that the similarity of the marks, the defendant's intent, and evidence of actual confusion are of particular importance. In addition, the Seventh Circuit has held that a court may consider other relevant factors, such as the party's marketing channels and whether a trademark is being used in a parody. Trademark protection is also available under certain circumstances, even in the absence of likely or actual confusion. The Federal Trademark Dilution Act benefits only famous trademarks against a weakening of their valuable distinctive quality. There are two basic types of dilution dilution by blurring and dilution by tarnishment. Dilution by blurring happens when a similar trademark chips away at the distinctiveness of a famous trademark. For example, someone selling Apple brand toilet seats or bulldozers will blur the ability of Apple to identify a single source, even if people buying that stuff didn't think Apple Computer made their bulldozer. Dilution by tarnishment happens when similarity between a mark or trade name and a famous mark harms the reputation of the famous mark. For example, and this is a real case, a guy that uses the trade name Victor's Little Secret for a store selling sex-related products is likely to tarnish the famous Victoria's Secret mark. There's no real risk of confusion here, but the company Victoria's Secret is seeking to prevent the gradual tarnishing of their mark. One major issue with dilution is that famous trademarks are hard to come by. While there are supermarks like IBM, Google, Budweiser, and Microsoft, courts have typically been hesitant to find less well-known trademarks to be famous. It's not like YouTube or something where you can be kind of famous. Your trademark has to be really, actually IRL famous to attain this status. Trademarks are fascinating, regardless of whether you're someone who enjoys strolling through the shopping mall with logos firmly affixed to your bags and coffee and clothes, or whether you believe that brands and trademarks have become so powerful that they've been internalized by modern society and dictate our aspirations, our self-image, and our lifestyles. As we watch Don Draper and James Bond conspicuously guzzle Heinekens, maybe we worry that brands are controlling and corrupting our creative content. Regardless, trademarks are ubiquitous. Trademarks help us make sound decisions about the products we need and want. They protect us from knockoff goods and they allow us to go about the daily business of our lives more quickly and more efficiently so that we can sit down, tune our Samsung television to PBS on our Comcast cable tuner, watch the season finale of Downton Abbey brought to you by Viking River Cruise Lines and Ralph Lauren. Thanks for watching. And as they say in Hank and John's hometown, don't forget to be awesome. Which is not a registered trademark. Which is how this happened. Tell either Eleanor or Alice uh, not to forget to be awesome. Oh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Crash Course Intellectual Property is filmed at the Chad and Stacey Emig Holt Studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it's made by all of these nice workers for hire. If you'd like to keep Crash Course freely available for everyone forever, you can support the series at Patreon, a crowdfunding platform that allows you to support the content you love. Speaking of Patreon, we'd like to thank our Headmaster of Learning, Thomas Frank, and our Vice Principals, Kathy and Tim Phillip, and Linnea Boyev. Thank you so much for supporting Crash Course. You can get awesome rewards for your support. You cannot get ownership of the Crash Course copyright, but you can get the satisfaction of helping people learn. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Well, what is a trademark? After watching the video, you might be still uh, confused. Well, don't be mad at yourself. You cannot follow what the professor was talking about. We will be back uh, to the details uh, of the entire uh, trademark system in China, comparing it with the system in the US. So you may just uh, get back to the pieces of video after taking this entire lecture, okay? So it might be much easier for you to understand what uh, the professor was talking about in that video.
What is a trademark? Well, the definition given by the World Intellectual Property Organization is that a trademark is uh, any sign that individualizes the goods of uh, a given enterprise and distinguishes them from the goods of its competitors. So, from this definition, you will see, well, and also other and definition is given, for instance, uh, by the U.S. Patent Office, USPTO. A trademark, a trademark is a word, a phrase, a symbol, or design, or combination of words, phrases, symbols, or designs that identifies and distinguishes the source of the goods of one party from those of others. And the definition given by OHIM, Office of harmonization of the internal markets, which is the trademark office of the European Union. It says a trademark is any sign which serves in business to distinguish the goods or services of one undertaking from those of other undertakings and over which the owner has an exclusive right. So if you considering if you consider the differences and the similarities so the core um, elements of these um, definitions we will say to be a trademark acceptable for registration with the trademark office the mark the sign must be capable of distinguishing goods or services of one supplier from those of another supplier so it may indicate the source of the goods. So the emperors could know who should be liable for the quality of the bricks used for the making of the Great War of China. Well, if you take a look uh, or, or, or reconsider those um, phrases or wordings of a trademark uh, and all those words, to express or tell you what is a trademark, you will say, well, all those keywords here, for instance, um, marks, right? It must be a mark, a sign, used for goods, you say, for services, registered or unregistered, to promote trade, for products, as individual properties, and source of services, exclusive, registered, and a geographical classification is must be enforced. So all those keywords here you see, and the more visible the words are, it means uh, it's been more frequently being used to describe what a trademark is. So trademarks help to distinguish between the goods of competing traders to individual consumers. Trademark help a consumer a customer to buy goods of a certain quality and to help us to make wise decision picking up the products we want and we paid for. Types of a trademark. A trademark can be used for goods and services. So if it's used for goods, we call it the product trademark. Well, for services, we may call it the service mark. And that's a, a distinction doesn't make much sense because it's simply um, marks used for different lines of uh, uh, products or services. But uh, there is another kind of a mark, a collective mark. Well, you see, the average or the normal trademark usually is owned by an individual company or an individual, just an individual. So it's owned by one person, legal person or natural person. But uh, in the case of a collective mark, it's owned not by a person, it's owned by an organization. It could be used by the members of such an organization. Why? Because uh, the members who use the collective mark attaching it to the products made by them 
simply to indicate that, uh, well, we are a member of that association or organization which enjoy reputations. It may help uh, the consumer to make a decision buying or picking up uh, products from numerous uh, products in the supermarket. So put simply, a collective mark is a sign registered in the name of a group, association or other organization for use by the members of such an organization or a member or, 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 or association in the course of a trade to indicate the user's membership in the organization. Of course, you don't want anyone to know that you're, you are a member of a bad association, right? Of course, those association organizations must be good for you to promote your products. Number two, another very special kind of a mark, certification mark. A certification mark refers to a sign controlled by an organization or a company capable of monitoring certain goods or services for use by organizations or persons other than such an organization on their goods or services to certify the geographical origins, material, a module of manufacture, quality, or other specific characters of the goods or services. Well, you might be a little bit confused, right? What the difference is between collective mark and a certification mark? Well, collective, well, collective marks um, are used by the members of this organization. So it could be used for many, many companies as long as those companies are accepted as an organization of that association. Um, but. Uh, so, so you can say, you, you, maybe you can say, well, a collective mark is owned collectively, owned by a group of person, legal person or nature person. Whereas in the case of a certification mark, it is always owned by one company, one legal person, one organization. For instance, ISO, International Standard Organization. Well, actually, that's a, that's a company. And why, why any other companies, for instance, for selling wine, selling furniture, selling TV, were happy to use ISO, the icon or this mark, for their own products? Because not everyone can use ISO these products, attaching it to their own products. There's a precondition, right? You must satisfy the quality criteria or other standards of uh, quality or, 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 or the more materials, even the uh, origins of your products in order to be qualified as a user of that certification mark. So certification mark is owned usually by one individual organization and it's being used by anyone, any company, which being certified by that company or that organization. And so the users of a collective mark and the certification mark could all be companies for selling products or providing uh, services, uh, but uh, the users of uh, a collective mark must be the member of the organization. Whereas the users uh, of a certification mark is just a, a client of uh, and that organization owns a certification mark, right? In order to uh, use ISO, they have ISO, they have different lines of uh, standards for different lines of uh, products and services, you have to make an application to um, that company, ISO, and um, to, um, make, um, to make a request to the, to the ISO 
organization that uh, please come to our factory, our company to uh, make uh, your own investigation and to see whether our uh, productivity or our production or uh, the quality of our products may satisfy the standards set for us by you under this mark. So put simply, a trademark acts to indicate its uh, commercial origin of goods, and a service mark is to indicate its commercial origin of services. Collective mark indicates membership of an association, whereas certificate certification mark is to indicate its compliance with the set standards of quality or um or, or, or origins of goods or products. There is um or there are many other signs which could be functioning as a trademark in the sense that it's, uh, they might also be capable of indicating the source of goods or services, telling you where the goods are from, the products from. It could be from that area or from the makers located in that area. For instance, GI, geographical indications. A GI is a sign used on goods that have specific geographical origin and possess qualities, reputation, or characteristics that are essentially attributable to that origin. An appellation of origin is a special kind of GI, AO. So GIs in China are protected in accordance with international treaties. And uh, like many other countries, our law also protects geographical indications, but under a separate regulation, not under trademark law. In different countries, uh, there might be a wide range of uh, concepts, including laws specifically for the protection of GI or AOs. Trademark law could be one of the firm for protection, but not the case in China. But uh, it might be possible to protect GI as a form of collective mark or certification mark, depends on how um, it's being formulated, what the scenario for protection could be uh, adopted by the interested party, but uh, uh, apart from the protection of uh, uh, collective mark or certification mark, um, GI is separately protected in a separate uh, regulation in China. Trade dresses could also be considered as a form of sign indicating the source of goods or services. For instance, the shape of uh, uh, Tabarong chocolate, the decoration of uh, uh, KFC, or the overall appearance of uh, Starbucks coffee. Um, in the case uh, decided by the Supreme Court uh, in 1992, it was held that a restaurant's decoration could be protectable trade dress. Trade dress protects the overall image and appearance of a product. It is the manner in which goods or services are presented to prospective purchasers. Once this manner of presentation or image and appearance has become an identifier of the source of goods or services, it can function as a trademark. So trade dress, to be protectable, it must be capable of distinguishing the goods or services 
functioning as the trademark. On the Chinese law, the trade dress is also protected, but not on the trademark law. The anti-unfair competition law of China provides for competition, provides for protections against a set of unfair competition acts. In Chapter 2 of the Unfair Competition Law of China, and it provided that any business operator shall not perform any of the following confusing acts that will enable people to mistake its products for another business products or believe certain relations exist between its products and any business products. So number one, Unauthorized use of a mark that is identical or similar to the name, packaging, or decoration of another business or commodity which has influence to a certain extent. So, to be protectable as a trade dress, using the term on the Chinese law, the decoration, packaging of uh, a products or overall appearance of the services provided uh, on the on the marketplace and the decoration or the packaging uh, must have influence to a certain exist to a certain extent. It must it means that the, the decoration must be uh, special, must kind of uh, famous or enjoying a level of uh, reputation. For instance, um, in the case of uh, <coughs> unfair competition uh, disputes against uh, the producers of uh, oils or drinks, the courts has established that the product, config the product configuration elements of a product, uh, which refers to the decoration uh, packaging of the product is subject to protection on the anti-unfair anti competition law. So the decoration uh, or the design of the products might be protected as an uh, industry design, but uh, you all understand now that say the period of uh, design patent protection is only 10 years. How about uh, the protection after the expiration of design patent? For instance, in the case of uh, a very famous case in China, the Zhao and the Wang Laoji, and the decoration of the drinks. In other words, uh, of course, for the as a first first place uh, being registered as a design patent, but uh, ten years later, it's being used for more than ten years, twenty years, it being becoming so famous, so popular on the market. So, so when a consumer and see that it's um, that the red bottom of drinks um, in their mind, this must be Jado Bo or Wang Laoji or the oil provided by that oil maker. So these um, decorations has become so famous, uh, so important to business, of course, become so valuable to business. The courts has made it very clear that to be protectable, number one, is um, must be of uh, uh, any uh, outstanding designing or special uh, configuration. Number two is must be distinctive or has acquired a secondary meaning to be distinctive. So to be protected under unfair competition law as uh, a 
decoration or product decoration or packaging or trade dress as a term used in the US law. The decoration itself must be possessing distinctive features, very special kind of design. Number two, has acquired a secondary meaning, becoming so distinctive that it may indicate the source of the goods or services. The combination between the source of the of the goods or services and the supplier of the goods or services has been so stable in the mind of an average consumer. One more type of uh, science that could also be functioning as, uh, as a sign indicating the providers or suppliers of goods is trade names. Trade names or business name is a name that uh, a company uses to identify the business when communicating with uh, their clients. This could be the same as the company name or it could be different from the company name. So the company name or corporate name is a legal name that is uh, recorded in the company commercial register. But the trade name is a core component of, uh, in, in many cases, the trade name is a core component, the most important part of the registered company name. Under the unfair competition law of China, in the appropriate use of uh, another business corporate name and trade name, may also give rise to liabilities under unfair competition law. I'll put it another way, the company name and trade name and the names of celebrities could be protected under unfair competition law as long as these names has influences to a certain extent. It's a must acquired secondary meaning. What is a secondary meaning? Now how to acquire a secondary meaning? What's the differences between a mark that was uh, uh, initially distinctive and those must be distinctive after many years of use acquiring secondary meaning. Those are all the cool uh, requirements for protection under trademark law and for the protection of any other commercial signs including trade names, trade dresses, um, we will be back to those uh, theories uh, later in the following uh, sessions. The legal framework for the protection of trademark law um, are, for instance, Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, in the case of for trademark registration and the classification of goods, the most important international conventions are the Madrid Agreements and the Nice Agreements on Classifications. In the European Union, there are a few uh, directives or, or legislations in establishing community trademark or the trademark registered uh, in European Union and protected in entire European Union, any countries which are members of European Union. But, uh, but uh, apart from the protection of uh, community trademarks in Europe, trademarks are territorially limited. A trademark registered in China can only be protected in China, acknowledged in China. It won't be protected in any other countries. But there is a one exception. In the case of a well-known mark, there could be 
a strong protection available to well-known mark. A well-known mark, if the mark is well-known in China but not registered in China, a very famous mark in Japan but not registered in China. If a Japanese mark and a well-known in China, then it could be protected to a certain extent under current Chinese trademark law. It's also a practice uh, in many other countries for the protection of well-known trademark. The current legislation in China for the protection of uh, trademark against the trademark law of China, whereas, whereas in the US, the development of uh, trademark system was very interesting and very uh, special considering the historical development of uh, patents and the copyrights. As we explained in previous lecture that uh, the US Constitution and has a very special clause, which is called the intellectual property clause, empowering the Congress to make any law relevant to the protection of writers and inventors, but uh, not trademark. So the Congress made uh, various attempts to make a federal law of trademark, but this law, the very first the trademark law of the US, the trademark case and the trademark law um, of uh, 1870 and 1876 uh, were held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of uh, the United States because uh, the Congress were uh, or the Congress made this legislation based on the intellectual property clause of the Constitution, whereas um, the Supreme Court was of the opinion that, sorry, the RP clause of the, our Constitution did not give you any um, power to make a law beyond the protection available to authors and inventors. Later, in response to the decision delivered by the Supreme Court of the U.S., the Congress passed the Lanham Act in 1946. And the most um, um, important part of uh, this uh, legislation is uh, that it's uh, contributed significantly to the creation of a federal trademark system. The, term, the Lanham Act was extensively amended after um, the dates of uh, making. So today in the United States, they, there is a federal trademark registration system and uh, federal protection of trademark available under the, under the US law and uh, business uh, operators uh, would always rely on the protection on the federal legislation and the case law instead of uh, uh, state legislations. But uh, it could be possible that um, the protection for trademark uh, available under federal legislation and state legislation in the United States. As we explained, uh, the legal protection for trademarks in the U.S. Uh, could be under federal legislation and the legislation in each state. But uh, the major protection nowadays uh, could be under the federal legislation. Whereas uh, in China, the source of, uh, of law for the protection of uh, China is also composed of uh, uh, many sources. Uh, the major 
of the preliminary most fundamental legislation is the trademark law of China, which was adopted in 1982 as amended 1998, 21, 2013, and 2019. You say the most recent amendment, amendments of our trademark law uh, was completed just one year ago. Our current uh, trademark legislation is quite uh, advanced, so at least not too bad. The source of law of China, apart from the legislation, the law made by the Congress of China, and may also uh, comprise uh, regulations, measures made by the central governments uh, and the ministries of central governments. In the case of trademark law, that is uh, the implementation regulations for trademark law of China and uh, a few other measures concerning the protection and enforcement of trademark in China. The administrative agency in charge of uh, trademark uh, administration, for instance, trademark registration and enforcement is the trademark office of China, which is uh, part of uh, the new National Intellectual Property Administration of China. Also, the Supreme Court of China has issued a number of uh, judicial interpretations concerning the protection of uh, trademark and interpretation of legislation in China. As we mentioned uh, in previous slides, the protection for business or commercial signs and not just limited to trademarks and trademark law of China, but also many other regulations. And another very important, increasingly important legisl legislation is the law of anti-unfair competition law of China, which provides, as you already see, the protection against um, infringements of the rights of uh, and trade dress or decorations of uh, uh, products and trade names and a few other uh, and any other acts that might be considered as unfair competition and detrimental to uh, moralities on the marketplace or to the uh, sound order of the market. The new anti-unfair competition law was just uh, amended in 2019. It was adopted in 1993, amended in 2011 and 2019. The last uh, amendments in 2019 was implemented uh, together with uh, the trademark law of China, um, as you see, trademark law plus anti-unfair competition law of China are the major legal protections available for the protection of uh, any commercial signs. But uh, the legal protection available on the trademark law and an anti-unfair competition law are actually, theoretically speaking, different uh, foundations for protection and different scenarios for protection. 